All right, welcome back. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and go back to the Donald Pardon case. Uh, I have Anthony Pardon, I apologize. We have Derek Myers with us uh, from the Law and Crime Network who's out there at the trial. And from what I understand, the sister, Deborah Pardon, um, has given testimony today, but the judge allowed the cameras to be blanked out and the uh, audio to be blanked out as well. Uh, just give us a little bit of a flavor of what the judge ruled with respect to that and why. Well, uh, she was asked, uh, Deborah Pardon, the sister, was asked by the state when she took the stand as their witness if she wanted to be seen by cameras. She said no. The judge leaned over to her and asked her, well, do you want your voice to be heard on camera, even if we hide and conceal your face? And she said no, and not unless I have to. At that time, the judge pushed the button on his desk. He has this little control panel in front of him. He pushes that button, and the camera shut off, and it went dark. And that's when I had to uh, run upstairs from the media room so we could get a play-by-play uh, on Twitter and social media on exactly what her testimony was going to be. Okay, so Derek, just to set up the scene for our audience, um, Deborah is testifying essentially for the prosecution. That is against her brother. She cut a deal with prosecutors for that testimony because she is tangentially involved in this scenario with regard to credit card fraud and things of that nature. Tell our audience a little bit more about what she was accused of, what she cooperated and got for, if you know, that cooperation, and what, the, what are the main strokes that the prosecutor's trying to get out here for the jury? What's her value? Well, the state uh, got what they called a proffer, and that's agreement where they signed with her. It's called a proffer agreement, and that is basically a deal that says, hey, if you cooperate with us, we're not going to prosecute, prosecute you for stealing and using these cards. Now, she didn't actually steal the cards from the murder scene. She testified and said... Uh, that her brother brought them to her, said that it belonged to a, another relative named Bonilla Anderson. Apparently, the family, the part of the family is related to somebody with the same last name as Anderson, which, of course, is the same last name as the victim. So the state said, hey, you testify and say that your brother brought this, these cards to you, that you illegally use them, even though they're not in your name, and we will not press charges and pursue uh, indictments against you for theft or misuse of the credit cards. It's interesting to note that the state did bring up during the testimony that um, Deborah Parton has a history of misusing credit cards and actually served some time in prison for burglary. So, I mean, I've had those witnesses on the stand as a prosecutor myself, and, uh, you know, they always say if you sleep with dogs, you may catch fleas. you got to be very careful with putting this kind of witness on. But this seems like a crucial witness to me because it's tying the victim's credit cards, the use of the credit cards, and also the cell phone uh, tower data that's placing them at various locations. Seems like kind of an important witness. Some of those witnesses do really well. Some of them don't. From the standpoint of the credibility of her, even with all those convictions, how did she come off on the stand? Well, she was certainly credible to the jury, I think, because she was answering honest questions. Uh, the defense and the state asked her about her criminal history. She had no problem answering those questions, admitting to a criminal history. They asked her if she had a cocaine drug addiction in the past. She admitted to that. She said she did have a cocaine drug addiction in her 20s and that she did relapse shortly before the murders, but that she wasn't high when she was using the stolen credit cards. And she says since her uh, brother has been arrested for the murder, she has relapsed and gone back onto cocaine. So when she came out and admitted to using drugs and her drug history and her criminal record, I think that really sealed the deal for the jury in terms of her credibility and that she was willing to tell the truth because it took a lot for her to admit to her past. Did, did she seem to, I always like this, did she seem to have any kind of eye contact with the defendant? And when she was testifying, what was the defendant's reaction in court? Because he's a very emotive fella. Right. So she was looking straight ahead. She would not make eye contact with the state. She really wasn't making eye contact with anyone. She was kind of just staring straight and down toward the ground every time she answered the question. She did stop and think about a lot of her answers, uh, but it did come by pretty compelling as if she was telling the truth. Anthony Parton has been emotional at times in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, rolling his eyes and things, but he looks down a lot at just at his desk that he's sitting in front of, and then he'll make a thinking motion where he takes his left hand and he places it on his chin as if he's thinking. When they show crime scene photos, he looks at those, shows no emotion, and he just sits there. Yeah, you know, we, we, we have to talk about that. Like, what is the right look for a defendant to have when you're in a courtroom? It's very difficult to instruct a person because they are who they are. But generally speaking right now in the prosecution's case, how do you see it proceeding? Have they hit any major hiccups yet? 
no hiccups so on the prosecution side that we can really tell their uh, witnesses all seem to have pretty much the certifications that you would expect from federal agents and local and state agents. Uh, the only uh, hiccup I think is going to come their way is a reasonable doubt. Of course, um, there was a couple of people who were inside the apartment prior to the police arriving. So uh, we'll have to see. But of course, that DNA, the state saying, was found on the iron cords that was used to bound and gag Rachel Anderson. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the defense presents that. We can see the defense presenting their side of the case sometime tomorrow afternoon, according to the defense attorneys that I spoke to just about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, I haven't gotten a good handle on, but I know they're using geospatial mapping of phones. Uh, both with respect to the crime scene itself as well as the uh, financial frauds that were occurring with the victims' credit cards. Uh, what does it look like to you in court? Are they, are they doing a good match in showing phones being connected to relevant parts of this case? Well, that's what we saw just before we took the lunch break about 45 minutes ago. They have a technology here in the state of Ohio that the state BCI, and that's the uh, state equivalent to the FBI, I would say, uh, they have a system called Cellbrite, and Cellbrite is a program that they use to uh, hack into phones. And once they get into that phone, they can get a lot of information. They also get tower records, of course, from the cell providers. In this case, it was T-Mobile and Sprint. Rachel Anderson had Sprint. Uh, Mr. Pardon had uh, T-Mobile, and uh, it was logging right around the time of the murders that his phone was hitting on the cell tower closest to Rachel uh, Anderson's apartment. So with that, uh, the defense is uh, going to have something that they're going to have to uh, explain later on tomorrow when uh, they speak up and start presenting their witnesses. Talk to us a little bit about these Google searches and how damning they uh, seem to be. I tell you, so it was, you ought to see the look on everyone's face in the courtroom when this happened because uh, these Google searches that were found on Anthony Pardon's search history was, how did Rachel Anderson die? And uh, Google searching her name. So uh, he uh, clearly saw this on the news media and wanted to know what the public knew or what the police knew and had been released through the media. It was quite shocking, actually. Uh, we were all in disbelief that he would actually type this into his uh, Google search history. Uh, well, real quick, Derek, uh, that could be somebody, like if somebody died that I knew, uh, I would find myself in saying, how did that person die? Could that cut also to the defense that why would he need to do that if he was the killer? Well, I was thinking that, too, uh, just as that as, as you would. Uh, it, it certainly does make a good argument, uh, but we'll know tomorrow uh, what the defense is going to do. They really didn't cross-examine uh, this uh, state witness uh, too much in depth uh, before we took this lunch break. So I'm hoping to see what kind of things we'll uh, see tomorrow when the defense starts to put on their witnesses. Derek Myers uh, out there for us at the Law and Crime Network. Thank you so much, Derek. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Brett. So, uh, what do you what do you what do you think? I mean, uh, from what he's saying, there it sounds like the prosecution is going pretty smoothly right now. Well, and I was thinking just exactly what you were saying. Okay, so the the argument could be made if he had killed her, he wouldn't be searching. He he would know. He wouldn't have to search unless he's trying to confirm what everybody else knows. But how do we get that information if he doesn't take the stand? You can't present that without him taking a stand, and that's where he's stuck with the, he's got the stolen credit cards and his sister's pointing a finger at him. Yeah, and DNA on, on some really bad stuff inside the apartment. Now, you've been a detective first grade uh, 20 years at the NYPD, and we have seen people do all sorts of crazy things that don't make explanations, but in fact did it. Could it be that he wants to see whether or not they've kind of are figuring it out? He's trying to see how far or how much information the police have. Um, and that it's not that he's trying to figure it out. He knows exactly, but he wants to know what they know. And that's exactly how the prosecution is presenting this. Hey, Siri, do the police know I'm the killer yet? You know, and that's, that's how the prosecution... Can, can is Siri answer? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. So, and, and that's how the prosecution is presenting it. So certainly there can be an alternate explanation for why he might uh, perform this type of search. However, coupled with all the cell phone pings, um, the use of the uh, debit card and the sister's testimony that kind of takes this out of, out of the realm of circumstantial and more closer towards the realm of actual physical evidence that she gave him the card. When you put all these things together, it's, it's very damning. It's difficult to explain this away. Yeah, and, and, but there, was, there are, like, I've just been around long enough to know weird things, like the brother's DNA, his semen was on her bathrobe, and mm -hmm. he gave this explanation as to, you know, what the victim's bathrobe, why that was. There were other people that were inside that apartment. I mean, is it possible, I mean, the fact that you have the proceeds of something that may have been a murder doesn't necessarily identify who the murderer was. I mean, there's close contact. He's there, the phone records. The defense would seem to me would say, yeah, all that stuff is true, but they haven't proven to you who the person was that did this. 
Uh, and right, and that's probably the strongest thing that they have. I mean, the, the brothers seem in being on the road, but it's hard to explain away. They also had a Jonathan Kennedy. Um, there was an issue between him and the victim. I don't know if that's going to be enough to overcome the fact that he had the, the, the victim's credit cards and his sister is pointing the finger at him saying, he, you know, he lied about it. We're not even sure what he told his sister about this, but I can't see it being a beyond reasonable doubt argument that Pardon can make with all this evidence against him. Yeah, and, and I know that there's also some, you know, extraordinary DNA in bad places that would be only, in my mind, from the perpetrator of that. But, Professor, I want to talk to you about the four, what I call the 404 evidence or the sure. other act evidence. Um, and that has been precluded. And that is with regard to a criminal background at age 14 uh, for commission of raping an eight year old girl, uh, at 15, convicted of raping a nine month old boy, uh, at uh, 16, uh, kidnapped, raped, and attempted to drown a 39-year-old mother of a girlfriend. Uh, Pardon was incarcerated for more than nine years in Georgia on two counts of failing to register as a sex offender. He was released. They didn't put the ankle monitor on him because, you know, the cost. I mean, I believe right. that's a quote, the cost. Yes. I mean, they, there were reports that this guy was a, a, a danger to the community. Um, none of that is getting out in front of this jury. Is there a way that the defense could trip up in a certain way, maybe even him taking the stand, that beyond just admitting it towards his credibility, it can substantive, substantively come in as other act evidence? I think the number one way that this would come in, where the defense could trip up, is if he takes the stand. And he has that look, you would know better than me, of that defendant who is just dying to get on the stand and tell his part of the story. Just from you know, some of the behavior already, he's dissatisfied with his attorneys, uh, defendants who are dissatisfied with their representation quite often feel, well, I need to get out there and get in front of this. And it's very difficult to present, uh, prevent a defendant from taking the stand. I think if he takes the stand, much of this is going to get out. And that's the real tragedy here. You know, all this, this indi lifelong indicia of antisocial behavior and somehow the feeling that this could have been prevented. Well, typically before we even get to the decision as to whether a defendant's going to take the stand, at the end of the state's case when they arrest the defense will make a motion to dismiss the case. All legitimate inferences go to the benefit of the state. It's very rarely granted, and it would seem to me will not be granted in this case, so he will ultimately have to make that decision. Thanks, guys, for that great analysis and for all of our reporters that are out there. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us.